Glory to Jesus Christ. Today is Friday, March 24th, the 26th day of the fast. Uh, and yesterday we concluded our homily from St. Cyril about the Divine Liturgy and Holy Communion. Uh, today we'll start a new homily, which will really actually take us uh, to the end of the 40 days. Uh, it's quite long, uh, and we'll break it into numerous parts, uh, but I thought it was very appropriate that we would pick this particular homily to read uh, because of our own journey through life, leading closer to our departure from this life, and what do we believe about what happens when we leave this life uh, and then to zero that down into this particular fast uh, that we're getting closer to celebrating, uh, first of all, the passion of Christ, his, his crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection. Uh, and this fits beautifully into where we find ourselves in time as well. So the homily that we'll read is homily number 18 uh, from St. Cyril on the words, and in one holy Catholic church, and in the resurrection of the flesh, and the life everlasting. Uh, and as he begins this homily, he quotes from us, from Ezekiel, what we all hear in church at the Matins of Holy Saturday. Uh, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. From Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1. The root of all good works is the hope of the resurrection, for the expectation of the recompense nerves the soul to good works. For every laborer is ready to endure the toils if he sees their reward in prospect. But when men weary themselves for naught, their heart soon sinks as well as their body. A soldier who expects a prize is ready for war, but no one is forward to die for a king who is indifferent about those who serve under him, and bestows no honors on their toils. In like manner, every soul believing in a resurrection is naturally careful of itself, but disbelieving it abandons itself to perdition. He who believes that his body shall remain to rise again is careful of his robe and defiles it not with fornication. But he who disbelieves the resurrection gives himself to fornication, and misuses his own body as though it were not his own. Faith, therefore, in the resurrection of the dead is a great commandment and doctrine of the Holy Catholic Church, great and most necessary, though gainsaid by many, yet surely warranted by the truth. Greeks contradict it, Samaritans disbelieve it, heretics mutilate it, the contradiction is manifold, but the truth is uniform. Now Greeks and Samaritans together argue against us thus. The dead man is fallen and moldered away, and is all turned into worms, and the worms have died also. Such is the decay and destruction which has overtaken the body. How then is it to be raised? The shipwrecked have been devoured by fishes, which are themselves devoured, of them who fight with wild beasts, the very bones are ground to powder and consumed by bears and lions. Vultures and ravens feed on the flesh of the unburied dead and then fly away over all the world. Whence then is the body to be collected? For the fowls who have devoured it, some may have chance to die in India, some in Persia, some in the land of the Goths. Other men against, again are consumed by fire and their very ashes all are scattered by rain or wind, whence is the body to be brought together again? To you, poor little feeble man, India is far from the land of the Goths and Spain from Persia, but to God, who holds the whole earth in the hollow of his hand, all things are near at hand. Impute not then weakness to God from a comparison of your feebleness but rather dwell on his power. Does then the Son, a small work of God, by one glance of his beams, give warmth to the whole world? Does the atmosphere which God has made encompass all things in the world? And is God, who is the creator both of the Son and of the atmosphere, far off from the world? Imagine a mixture of seeds of different plants. For as you are weak concerning the faith, the example which I allege are weak also. 
and that these different seeds are contained in your single hand, is it then to you who are a man a difficult or an easy matter to separate what is in your hand and to collect each seed according to its nature and restore it to its own kind? Can you then separate the things in your hand and cannot separate the things contained in his hand and restore them to their proper place? Consider what I say, whether it is not impious to deny it, but further attend, I pray, to the very principle of justice and come to your own case. You have different sorts of servants, and some are good and some bad. You honor, therefore, the good and smite the bad. If you are a judge, to the good you award praise, and to the transgressors punishment. Is then justice observed by you, a mortal man? And with God, the ever-changeless King of all, is there no retributive justice? Nay, to deny it is impious. For consider what I say. Many murderers have died in their beds unpunished. Where then is the righteousness of God? Yes, oftentimes a murderer guilty of fifty murders is beheaded once. Where then shall he suffer punishment for the forty-nine? Unless there is a judgment and a retribution after this world, you charge God with unrighteousness. Marvel not, however, because of the delay of the judgment. No combatant is crowned or disgraced till the contest is over, and no president of the games ever crowns men while yet striving, but he waits till all the combatants are finished, that then deciding between them, he may dispense the prizes and the chaplets. Even thus God also, so long as the strife in this world lasts, succors the just but partially, but afterwards he renders to them their rewards fully. So we'll stop there and pick up again on Monday uh, with this uh, important topic about the resurrection of the dead. Glory to Jesus Christ.